Today's guest is Bruce Livesay. He's a journalist with the National Observer. He brings focus, intensity, integrity, and a broad range of perspective. It's fascinating when he gets talking about New Brunswick and how he thinks New Brunswick could have a breakthrough. Hope you enjoy the interview. Please support the show, watch the show, share the show. And now, for Mr. Livesay. So thanks for coming today. My pleasure. And taking time out of a busy day, whirlwind tour to Fredericton. Yes. 24 hours, maybe? Yes, exactly. 24 hours. Great. Um, can we explore into media right away and how much media has changed? Well, I mean, obviously, the, the, the big change in the media was the Internet. So before the media, as we called it, was television, radio, n newspapers, and magazines. Mm -hmm. um, and, y you know, in, in some communities, depending on the size, you had alternative newspapers, especially alternative weeklies. Mm -hmm. And it was all sustained, with the exception of things like the CBC, which was publicly funded, even though they get money from advertising, but it was all sustained by advertising. Um, and advertising from largely corporations, which had an impact on the content. Um, so the, the content tended to be generally very much support the status quo. Uh, since the emergence of the Internet, the Internet has destroyed the economic model of the mainstream media. Uh, advertising, which once appeared in newspapers on, and on TV, has now flowed online. And um, the problem with that is that if you're a media organization, you can no longer garner as much money from online ads as you used to from, say, a display ad in a newspaper. Mm -hmm. So suddenly the mainstream media saw their budgets decline dramatically, and the newspaper industry has been hurt the hardest. Yep. And, and newspapers uh, across the world, uh, but especially North America, are in deep trouble. Um, the largest newspaper chain in Canada, Post Media, probably would be technically bankrupt next year. Um, is that why the Globe Mail isn't going to run a print edition anymore? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's all part of the same trend. Yeah. It's And the trend is to... They've, they've tried to move online. So the, the thinking was, if we go online... Uh, What's the big difference? Well, st we still have readers. They'll read us online instead of in a paper form. Right. The problem was the advertisement didn't fall in the same quantity. Hmm. Because one of the things that they've discovered is that if, if advertising has become very what's called hyper-segmentalized uh, hyper or something to that effect. Anyway, so now they know, for example... Dennis, they know what exact type of toothpaste you like, what type of car you're likely to drive, all yeah. based on stuff yeah. you look at online. Yeah, metadata. Metadata. And so they can aim target yeah, ads to, to directly to you. You know, So if you like Colgate, guess what? You're seeing Colgate ads when you go look, yeah. look on stuff on Facebook or Google. So the, um, the idea of having a mass advertising medium like a newspaper has with the internet has vanished. They don't need to do that anymore. Okay. And what that has meant is that the uh, they don't need a reader to be looking at a news story or a documentary or a, a TV show. You could be looking at a, 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 a your, your friend's Facebook pictures, uh, at a, a, ki a kitty video, some you know, any any um, trivial rubbish, whatever. And if they're interested in your eyeball, yep. and if your eyeball is looking at that particular thing, they can get an ad to you. So therefore, the necessity of journalism being the vehicle to bring an audience to advertisers has vanished, which has left the mainstream media now in a dire economic situation. And so... That's the crisis we're in. Now, at the same time, uh, new media has emerged. That's online and, 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 is, and to a certain extent has adapted to the Internet reality. Which is what you're a part of with the National Observer. That's right. Um, I wanted to start with that because it creates a context. If uh, we give a brief history of the shifts in journalism, media, advertising, um, it has a consequence on the notion of public trust and public narrative. So a simple version would be um, the United States is going through its 
changes with its current president. Um, this notion of fake news is now part of the narrative. Um, so somewhere in there, the public who once used to trust the news person who would sit there at six o'clock and give you great content and kind of let you figure it out for yourself, what you believed or didn't believe, because it was so well documented and supported. And today it's like, where do people find places for information, knowledge, wisdom that they can trust? Yeah, because you're right in the thick of it. Or well, is... I, it's a complicated problem because even before the rise of the internet and, and the, the problem the mainstream media had is that the, the public's trust in the mainstream media had been declining for decades. So you could say that the, 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 the trust and respect of, of journalism as a, as a field um, and what journalists were doing you know, in the last 50 years, peaked in the, in the 70s, in the sort of post-Watergate era, you know, so the, there was a, in the 70s in particular, journalism was um, held in high esteem. Hmm. But since the 70s, it has been in decline, and now it's very low. But so, and the, and the decline had started before the advent of, of, long before the advent of the internet. The internet has complicated matters, because as you note, in this great ocean of information you find online, what is true and what is not, and 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 it means that the the while before there used to be, you know, a certain standard training expectation to become a journalist. You know, you would go to journalism school, probably, um, and uh, you would start off in a you know say in a small newspaper and work your way up to a bigger newspaper, and you would learn the craft and and. You're, you're well, describing a scene from the shipping news where a young, young coil that's is working right. at the newspaper. That's right, and that and that has disappeared too because a you don't you've never really necessarily needed to get journalism training, but but the but the the idea of having, you know, being talented enough to get a job at a small newspaper and then if you're more you know more talented or to develop certain skills you get picked up by a larger newspaper and. Yeah. And your your skills grow. All of that has gone out the win the window. Yeah. So so now the points of entry for, for for people who say they're doing journalism are much lower. Anybody can start a, a website, a blog, and put stuff up, put their ramblings up, put whatever they want up. So it's absolutely true. It's difficult to discern often what is true or not, but. I mean, there's ways to, one of the things that we try to do, for example, at The Observer, is you, if you're saying something, you can link, for example, online, you can link to documents, you can link to other reports, you can link to reports that you're referring to. Mm -hmm. So that if people are actually questioning the veracity of what you're writing, you can actually, they can go physically to the link you're referring to, they can look at the study you're referencing, and see for themselves. So there are benefits to, 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 to the online reality that didn't ex exist either before, where now the public's access to, to the raw data, the raw material that might be, might be the basis of, of a media report is now available to them. Mm -hmm. And that's where you often see people criticizing the media, saying, well, wait a second, this news story distorted what that particular report or person said. Um, so, so the, you could say one of the benefits of, of the web is that it keeps journalists honest because anybody can now write in and say, wait a second, you got that all wrong and yeah. this is why. We saw that a fair amount with um, the last federal election in Canada, uh, six weeks long, and it gave people enough time to go digging. And uh, there is a whole conversation happening in social media, um, claims that Harper or the other parties would make and they would do fact checking and then a whole string of conversation would follow in behind no he said this over here no they said that over there um for those that were passionate enough to take on doing all that work do you like working in this because you've kind of jumped yourself right into the middle of what you framed up as as the, the moment we're in today i mean in this new media environment yes yeah i mean y yes and no i think that the the big change for journalists as a whole um, is now chronic instability. So once upon a time, a journalist would arrive, if you got to a big newspaper or you went to the CBC, 
um, or some other TV out, out, outlet, there's a good chance you could spend possibly your entire career there. Or if you move, you move to another very well-established newspaper and could finish your career there. When I joined the CBC in 2001, I thought I'd be there for the next 25 years. Hmm. And I left after, I quit after six. Hmm. I, I returned for a couple more, a few more years, but but only on contract and then um, left. And so the the notion of holding a job in, in one media outlet You'd get a good salary, you'd get a pension plan, you'd have job security. That's all gone. Yep. Okay. Um, uh, and that's, and, and then the second thing that's really changed, is really evident, is is the money to do journalism. So, because journalism requires money. You need money um, to, to do research, you need money to travel if you want to, especially if you're doing TV, to shoot things. Yep. Um, you know, it, 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 and the more money, the better job you can do. And so the money, I, again, the money when I got in, uh, you know, has always been a struggle in this country, but it has definitely declined. So now you're often even begging online for money to do projects. Yeah, I watched your clip um, when you were doing a version of that for three minutes and and this show has many of the same symptoms as what you're describing. Yeah. It's part of that shift, and the shift hasn't matured yet, where there's confidence in certain sources, therefore they're well-funded by the public. And That's right. So in a way, we're, we're kind of like buskers, yeah. like media buskers, you know? Well, and, and, <laughs> but it's also meant that, that, you know, you could say a positive to a certain extent is that journalists have been forced to learn to, do, to multitask. So mm. now we have to know how to do radio, print, online, um, and video. And the technology, fortunately, has made all of that easier. Mm -hmm. You know, you can, um, you can film now with much smaller, cheaper cameras. The quality with HD is fantastic. You can edit it on your laptop yeah. and, and, you know, have it finished quickly. Well, before, that would require a much larger and more expensive apparatus. Mm -hmm. So the digital technology has definitely made some, and, and, it's, and it's made the transmission of information easier. So if you want to either send your story to people or reach a larger audience online, it's much easier today. Stuff that was once filmed, was once recorded, which in the old days just went straight into a vault at the CBC or some, you know, into the newspapers, um, library and was never seen again or harder to find you can now access online easy so like all these things with innovation it's got its pros and it's gone mm -hmm. can you share what's fun in that because as you map out all these pieces there's also a, a latitude or a flexibility because you are the master of your own fate to a degree as long as there's at least some funding there <laughs> to let you go pursue a story mm -hmm. So, have you found in your professional career that uh, the shifts in technology and in funding, um, in a way, have opened up some things for you that you could get at, whereas before you you couldn't get at them? And can you give an example, if there is one? <laughs> <laughs> you know, because, because you've you've you know gone at a couple of giants with the Koch brothers and the Irvings and stuff. Somewhere in there, you had to have negotiated some sort of internal politic or internal pressure to get it to fruition and out so people see it. Maybe nowadays you've got more flexibility just to go ahead and do it the way you see it and then get it out. Well, I think the, uh, you know, what I, I think probably is true is the if you can't get a story for this particular medium you'll find another home elsewhere now to a certain extent that was always somewhat the case i've had many a number of times in my career um attempted or you know I've actually been assigned uh, to do a project for x and then they they, they got cold feet so i could t i took it elsewhere right um uh so uh, that has has existed before. I think it's easier now. I think that the number of outlets that potentially could run certain stories has grown. So there's the 
you could say that the the landscape of the media, which was more narrow in in the pre-internet age, has now expanded, um, and technology has made it easier. So I did this this documentary on the Koch brothers, which originally I did for Global TV until they killed it. I did it for a online news um, a television network based out of Baltimore, which is run by a Canadian a guy I know, and, and he saw what happened to me and said, well, why don't you do it for us? And um, we did. And, you know, that might have not been, you know, like 20 years ago, probably impossible to, to have done because, you know, being able to run a, a, a television network online, which is much less expensive than setting up a real television network, um, you know, you can do now. Hmm. And how did that story run after you got it out? Well, it ran online and, you know, it, it did okay. You know, again, it was... This is the other, <laughs> you could say, the other problem is that, you know, before... When I joined, uh, I joined the CBC in 2001. Um, people there used to talk about... Because I joined the Fifth Estate... Uh, that the show in its heyday was getting well over a million viewers a week. When I started working there, we were we were probably averaging around four to five hundred thousand. By now, it's down even much less than that. Um, and that's because audiences have become fragmented. So it's the same that's happened in the the uh, the music popular music industry before. Big acts used to sell in the tens of millions of albums. Now they're happy to sell in the hundreds of thousands, or you know, anything yeah. excess of, of a million is considered a hit, yeah. because the markets become fragmented, and and so nowadays um, uh, you are competing online with so many sources and and things that people can look at. That, that when you even do a serious documentary on a serious subject, hmm. you know, it kind of vanishes into the ether. So we got, you know, we got in the tens of thousands of hmm. viewers. That almost wanders into a, a gray area where in a fragmented market with a really good story, there may be some who, um, in order to gain bigger audience, they'll do all kinds of silly things to get audience and therefore the story loses its integrity. Yeah. So do you have any uh, examples of ones you've observed? Because it's obvious you've kind of held the integrity of it because it'll be the long road to public trust. It's like if you see the content over three or four or five years, like, this is what we're trying to do compared to I just got 10 million hits because I did something outrageous. Mm -hmm. That So journalism, in, in, don't even want to call it journalism, but there, there's some celebrity types that do versions of journalism but they're drawing lots of audience in that fragmented market by almost being outrageous yeah um maybe mr riley out of fox news kind of fits that category um in a healthy outrageous would be the comedy fake news <laughs> shows like john stewart john oliver where they're doing satire but they draw a bigger audience than some new shows do using news as their raw material and often more credibility mm. You know, so do you have any um, thoughts about that to help audience? You know, to help the audience discern. It's like pay attention. It might be funny, but but it's not real. Um, Malcolm Gladwell does a great revisionist history, and he does a great piece on how satire in the states has kind of failed itself. Right. Well, I I think as you mentioned, there there's been. You've seen this, well, okay, so there's a, a couple things to unpack. One is that the mainstream media has, has as, I, as, as I was saying earlier, has fallen into great disrepute. So it is viewed much more dimly by the public. Hmm. That has left the door open for things like The Daily Show or Samantha Bee's show or John uh, Irving. Um, Oliver. Oliver. Who are humorists who come out of the world of, of comedy but are using satire to actually portray reality much better than the mainstream media does. Hmm. Who, who will, you know, one of the things, for example, one of the things you can't do as a mainstream journalist 
let's say, you know, you're dealing with a politician, as an example, who is clearly an idiot and saying idiotic, ridiculous things. You cannot say this man is an idiot. You know, he is saying completely ridiculous things. As You can't. But, a, but, a, but a, uh, a, a someone like John Oliver or John Stewart can. Right. And it, which is one of the reasons they are now held in higher esteem often because it is self-evident this person <laughs> is an idiot. Yeah, speaking of truth. You know, if you were looking, if you were covering John, uh, Rob Ford during the years he was the mayor of Toronto, I mean, it would have been, I mean, I didn't, I was, you know, I was not, that's not, I was not, uh, I wasn't a City Hall type reporter. But it would have been hard not to have been saying to the public, this man is an imbecile. He's an infant. What the hell is he doing mayor of the city? Yeah. Um, there was a, f <laughs> there's a very funny video. You could see it online. Um, John Barber was a columnist for the Globe and Mail. And this was in, this is a few years before Rob Ford became mayor when he was just a city councillor. And there was, and there was someone was filming a scrum at City Hall in Toronto, and uh, Barber was trying to ask Ford some questions, and he was being interrupted. And anyway, under his breath, he calls Rob Ford a fat fuck, and uh, a politician, a friend of uh, Ford, heard it. A guy called George Mamaliti, and starts yelling. You call him a fat fuck. You call him a fat fuck. And Ford, who had missed it, <laughs> you know, starts yeah. chasing. And Barbara sort of then run, literally runs away. And, and, and there's, there's a scene of Ford chasing Barbara down the city hall hallway, <laughs> screaming, him, did you call me a fat fuck? <laughs> because Barbara... Had no knew instinctively that he crossed the line as a journal, the mainstream journalist. Yeah. That that as a, a mainstream journalist, you cannot call a politician a fat fuck, <laughs> even if you think he is a fat fuck. <laughs> so this was this is the this is now in today's environment in 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 shows like uh, the, the the satire news shows. They can do that. Yeah. They can use profanity. They can call these people idiots yeah. and and make fun of them. Um, and that, I think, have instinctively the public recognizes that that's more true than all this that very careful mainstream media. Well, you know, being reserved, we can't say yeah. anything yeah. that would be remotely subjective. I see this with the CBC in particular. You know, the CBC. Um, there's so many stories they will not do because they do not want to be seen as being biased. Isn't that fascinating? Because at the same time, they'll still emerge as being biased. If there's another narrative running through their country, and we used American examples, we could use some of Canadian examples too, like Rob Ford or, or 22 Minutes or Air Farce, you know. There was a gentleness, though, to those two compared to the edge that the American ones bring. But, but that trusting the media is... Because somewhere in the audience, there is now an expectation that I'm only, why am I being told this? You know, it, and there's that little head to it, and I'm not too sure, kind of. Because then you find out later that the media decided to print, present the story this way, and they left out that, 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 like you referred to earlier. So how do you ever get past that, that bias? Because there was a time, um, whether it's Snolt and Nash, uh, way back CBC days, or... Um, Walter Cronkite in the States and similar that uh, it was taken as we're being we're even being given a nice context here right. rather than why are they telling me that so uh, I would love to hear how do we recover that <laughs> that trust that because some of it can come through humor maybe we should allow reporters and journalists to bring that part of themselves without making them celebrities in the process. Well, but it's, it's it discerning eye, discerning voice. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I don't. What I do is uh, investigative journalism, which is very much um, based on, you know, rigorous research, 
well fact-checked and 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 with the appearance of trying to be um, neutral even if it's clear I have a point a kind of a point okay. like if I'm saying if I'm saying this particular character let, let's take the Irvings as an example okay. you know if I if you, you would read my story and say well he doesn't like the Irvings uh, but I haven't printed anything that's not true mm-hmm. like I'm not making stuff up I'm not yep. you would read my stories and say well he's not really giving me opinions he's citing documents and facts and he's quoting people and you know even though it's clear that uh uh you know i'm i'm saying something that's uh with a with uh i'm saying something's critical that seems to have a point of view and i think which i think is completely fair okay okay? if i was publishing mistruths or untruths or things i couldn't defend you know Mm. Um, then, uh, then I would lose credibility. But y- you can, if you feel that the evidence is that someone is, let's say, a fraudster, then you know you're not there to sort of say, well, you might be a fraudster, or who knows. If the evidence is that he's a fraudster, and you can lay that out, mm-hmm. and and the the evidence is convincing, then as you as a journalist should do that, and do but do it in as fair a manner as possible give the person you're calling a fraudster opportunity to respond mm-hmm. usually fraudsters don't respond mm-hmm. um and make sure that you don't you're not presenting the information out of context um and that's what i attempt to do so i don't you know i'm not putting humor in my pieces i'm i'm trying to mm-hmm. keep as little of my personality out of the stories as possible mm-hmm. Still makes me want to wander into how a journalist kind of creates the framework or the paradigm or the narrative, um, justified through rigorous research, but still is only one piece in the puzzle. It's a conundrum. That's, that's what I'm trying to get at. In the larger social narrative, how do we generate a story about the common good? And we could take any particular piece, like uh, Kennedy's pipeline, um, the impact of the Irvings on the province and know that everybody might approach it with their particular perspective, equally researched, but the human habit still seems to be pro and con, or black and white. But that's fine. But, but, well, how do we get past that to find where the but, common good is? But they're, 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 you have to understand that people view the world individually very different. Mm-hmm. Okay? It can be political reasons they do, it could be religious reasons, it could be familial reasons, there could be a whole the psychological reasons, right? Mm-hmm. The um, history is written in many versions. Mm-hmm. Even things that you can agree on, that something happened, people have different interpretations of why it happened, yeah, sure. or the importance of that event. Yep. Um, so the reality, the, the great myth, the great lie, of the media, and there's a historical reason for this. Once upon a time in North America, and I'm presuming Europe, prior to the 1940s and 50s, in most major cities, you had numerous daily newspapers. And then they eventually, as sort of the laws of capitalism come into play, they consolidated, and, and soon most by the 1960s, 70s, and definitely by the 80s, you had one newspaper cities. You had, you know, and usually owned by a chain, a yep. large anonymous chain. Yep. For the newspapers to justify that reality, they created this concept of objectivity. Yep. And so when you went to journalism school, you were told you had to be objective, yep. which is the biggest bunch of bullshit on the planet. Because yep. the very selection of facts. It, you know, because you can't, <laughs> you cannot, when you, 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 if you're writing about X, you get a hundred facts. Well, you cannot, per, because the story would be too long to put all a hundred facts in, you make subjective decisions about what, you go, about what you're going to include and exclude. Yep. That's subjective. Why did Bruce put those ten facts in the story and why did Dennis put these ten facts? Well, that's because they were governed by their own view of the world. And that's fine. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. In, in a perfect media environment, you would have co- com- 
you would have competition. And so a reader could read all the different points of view and form an, an opinion of what generally is the truth. Okay? Right. And that went out the window when newspapers in particular became monopolies. Now we're back to a time, ironically, where we're going back to the, almost the pre 1950s situation, where now you can access different media outlets covering the same event. So, for example, the British Guardian, hmm. which used to be a newspaper that covered just England and, you know, and maybe a little bit of the, the odd foreign correspondent. Well, the Guardian is now online. It's one of the, the, the biggest and most well-read online news portals in the world. They have also journalists around the world. And they will cover events in the United States slightly different than, say, the New York Times or the Washington Post or the Toronto Star or the, or the Globe and Mail. So you as a, a consumer of news can well, read the Guardian, you can read the New York Times, you can read the Washington Post, you can read, you can read um, outlets from the right and the left and the liberal and the center, and then you usually kind of form your own opinion. And that's the way it should be. Um, I'm a Quebec boy by birth. I grew up with Le Devoir, Le Journal de Montréal. Um, oh, what's the third one? There's Montreal Star, Montreal Gazette. La Presse. La Presse, that's it. So you had five dailies. It was uh, not unusual to watch. And I lived in the country, but the influence of the city was, was quite huge. So five newspapers every day. Um, you could pretty much, if you took the time, <laughs> you, you could pretty much figure out, you know, the different angles and then model through for yourself. That's right. Social media more or less offers uh, those that are interested something similar. Um, sourcing is going to be a bit more challenging. You're not coming from five sources. For print media, you're coming from multiple sources. Yeah. Um, can we slide into you a little bit? Um, what's fun? Like, what are you working on now that's, that's fun and gets you, gets you juiced? Because you're working through a major transition in your profession. Mm -hmm. From, you know, starting in 2001, CBC, job security, uh, not unlike many other industries where there were shifts in work stability and resources. Um, but there's a cre creative element to what you do, too. Um, or uh, the news hound element, you know, where you got your nose and you're following something. There's something to this I need to find out. What, what drives that? Well, I mean, I'm, I'm in a, because I am uh, have been doing this for over 30 years, um, and I have a restless nature, I, I can do radio, uh, television, magazine, and newspapers, and now online. So, uh, and I generally have projects going on in all, f all five different forums. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but I generally, uh, my, the thrust of my work in recent years has been looking at, um, I would guess I broadly call it corporate malfeasance. So I tend to do investigations of companies behaving badly. And I wrote, in fact, I wrote a book, it was a best-selling book for Random House that came out in 2012 called Thieves of Bay Street, which explored the uh, the thievery of the financial industry, and this was especially in light of the credit crisis. Um, but I've done investigations into numerous companies, including the Irving family, you know, the Koch brothers, um, you know, one of Canada's largest uh, clothing companies, Guild and Activewear, and the use of sweatshop labor, um, mining companies, you know, financial fraud, the whole gamut. So. So I've had a very long career and covered, you know, countless, countless stories and subjects. But generally, the thrust of my work has been in, in recent years has been around corporate malfeasance. Um, I mean, at the moment, I'm doing some work on CSIS and the RCMP and their history, their, their very bad history towards uh, spying on all the wrong people. Um, but uh, generally, my work is on uh, what bad things that companies do. Have you ever run into moments where um, you received pressure because someone knew you were working on a story and are you allowed to share what that was like? Yeah, I mean, I mean I've been working on a story for over, uh, almost a year that's currently with the Globe and Mail that's about a 
um, well, ostensibly it's about the battle between two rich guys in the financial industry on Bay Street fighting it out. And about one of the guys is alleged to have, let's say, been less than honest and transparent about his losses. And um, he, he is a very aggressive and litigious man. And he has threatened now two news, because the, the, the story was originally for Canadian Business Magazine, and then they basically got, got cold feet and dropped it. So I took it to the Globe Mail and they've been sitting on, well, sitting, they have had the story for months. They were supposed to run in the summer, but they're extremely cautious. And I don't necessarily blame them, but uh, that's entirely because they know they're dealing with a very aggressive and litigious man. And given the state of the print industry, the last thing they probably want is that. Well, in my view, he will never sue. If, if he sued, he would never pursue it. Because he, he, he did sue. He sued this opponent of his on, on Bay Street uh, for defamation and then has pretty much let, from what I understand, the loss of language. Hmm. And I can imagine that's because he doesn't want to go through disc discovery because people would say, okay, we will now see your books. Hmm. And that's when... <laughs> Truth and reality <laughs> <Good merge. bang. laughs> Um, Do you have any stories or work that you've done that um, you're really particularly proud of because it created a social change or created an awareness that um, it felt like you'd done a really good thing by bringing something to the surface? Does that make sense? I'm looking yeah, for yeah, a completion yeah. of the circle. Okay, so there's two things about this. One of the early expectations I had as a journalist was that if you wrote a story exposing some terrible misdeed, that the misdeed would get corrected. That doesn't happen. Good. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it sometimes happens, but more often than not, it doesn't. The misdeed does not get punished. The problems continue. Um, so that's one of the first sort of bits of naivete that to fall by the wayside is the notion, oh, I've written the story, therefore, logically, people should act accordingly and fix the problem. Mm -hmm. that, that doesn't happen. Um, but now and then it does happen. And actually, one of my earliest experiences in this respect was here in New Brunswick when I worked for the, the, the Daily Gleaner for a couple of summers. And one of the summers... Um, I caught wind of the fact that the New Brunswick government was going to do some serious cuts to the education system. And it was luck would have it, the publisher at the time had his own kids in school. He wasn't happy about the idea that there'd be less teachers. So I began doing this series of stories documenting mm -hmm. the cuts. And they were put on the front page, and there was an uproar. And there was F at FHS, they held, you know, kind of parent rallies where they 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 were quoting <laughs> they were quoting they were quoting data from my stories about you know the cuts. Yeah. And the government backed off when they dropped it. So now and then, uh, you know, you you see a cause and effect. You you see. Um, uh, you see, <laughs> you see investigations started. You see things change, but it happens far less than you think. Hmm. Uh, you, as I said, the assumption when I was when I started, I thought, oh well, if you expose some terrible thing that, you know, people will run to the barricades and fix the problems, and uh, mm -hmm. that's not that doesn't happen very often. You've answered a piece in a bigger puzzle about where does change come from, social change come from. Um, and it isn't necessarily from knowing deeper set of facts or having something resonate and, and exposed. Um, can we flip a little bit? And uh, you spent a fair amount of your life or a certain part of your life uh, living in New Brunswick. You now you work out of Toronto and you've got this national perspective. Um, can you share some thoughts about um, from your view, what you think New Brunswick should be doing in order to get its wheels going. 
the narrative in this province tends to be the same. Uh, we'll elect governments, we'll rotate governments through, everyone will do it on the premise of change, nothing really changes. Um, and yet on a national scale, there's lots of change. And our little province could, in some ways you could use the cliche, we're so far behind we could take a leap ahead from food security and protection of water and land, um, some basic industries. Um, will lumber sustain itself, that industrial model, or is it time for it to go for another model? Uh, you want to add your layer and perspective, sort of from here, but not from here? Well, I mean, I, I don't think it's a secret, but I think the the one of the biggest impediments to, to change is the, is, the, is the power of the urban group of companies, the urban family, which has dominated the life of this province for many decades now. And, um, and I think it's had a number of effects, but um, one possibly, which is hard to measure, is it's prevented competition from outside companies to come into this region. Um, and it's, they, they created, uh, their, Casey Irving created his company, which is called, in a, in, a, in a method called vertical integration, which whereby he wants to control the entire production resource process from beginning to end. Yeah. So if he's going to produce a newspaper, he wants to control the forest, uh, the trees that are grown, yeah. that make the, the, the newspaper, or the newsprint. He wants to control the, the sawmill, the pulp and paper mill, and ultimately the newspaper. You know, uh, uh, and, and the problem with that, and he's done that over many industries, is that it, it means there's... Probably, that's a hard thing to measure, but I would gander much less competition here. And when you have less competition, you have less innovation. Hmm. You have less um, excitement within the economy. Because the biggest thing that causes, at least in my life, you know, again, I, I, coming from a very competitive industry, which is the media, you know, what, what gets everybody going is the, the, the notion that your competitor is on to something faster than you are. You know, or doing something more innovatively, doing something new. And everybody borrows from each other. Hmm. But if you have a very closed economic system that's dominated by one economic group, which in this case is the Irvings, I think it has a dampening and stultifying effect. The other problem is that because they're so dominant, is they, they for all intents and purposes, the, 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 the provincial government is captured by the, by the, the Irvings in the sense that they do the bidding of the Irving family. So it's hard for the government to sort of step outside of this paradigm. And if you go back to, for example, the 1960s, and this is how far you have to go back, you know, Louis Robichaud, for example, was fighting to bring in outside companies into things like the forestry industry and, and, and mining um, to give the Irvings competition. And Casey Irving hated him for this and went to war against Robichaux and it was one of the reasons that Robichaux lost uh, as Premier in 1970 and, and then since then there's nary ne been a peep out of the Premier since you know, complaining about the power of the Irvings hmm. so um, the, the capacity of the provincial government to change this, this the, the, the fact that they are dominated by this one um for family and all of their companies, because you have to remember that they they control between 174, uh, 174 to as many as 250 companies, and it's in transportation, it's in energy, it's in forestry, it's in minerals and, and, and mining, it's in food, um, you know, it's it's shipbuilding. So, you know, it's not like the McCain's or the Olins are dominant in one industry. You know, food, beer, yeah. the Irvings cover the gamut, yeah. and it and and I think I would argue that what is held back, and and I think like if you're a, uh, even thinking of coming to live here, and 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 you, you're you're facing the reality that you're going to be reading Irving newspapers, you're you're, you're filling your gas up at their their gas stations, yeah. you know. Uh, 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 traveling on their buses, you know, it, it's it's a kind of a, uh, it's a bit dispiriting. And the fact that 
governments have shirked their responsibility because we have antitrust, anti combine laws on the books, which they refuse to implement. Because the role of the state historically is to ensure competition within the business field. So the monopolies and oligopolies mm -hmm. will not form. Mm -hmm. We now live in what I would call the neoliberal age where that governments have stopped doing that. And New Brunswick is the perfect and, uh, and I would say tragic case example of what happens when governments don't rein in corporations getting too large and don't allow competition to uh, occur in a local market. And I think that has a, a psychological effect on the population. Hmm. And one of the things that, at least from what I've seen, and maybe it's changing now, <coughs> is a tremendous passivity in this province towards this reality. So they do, they vote. They, you know, one thing, the interesting things that's happened is that before you used to have governments that would change every 16 years. I mean, Hatfield, for example, was in forever. McKenna was in for a long stretch. Now every election time, yep. there's a new government. And I think that reflects a growing mood that people are impatient with the same old, same old. Yep. Um, that they realize, but, but they haven't got to that ideological, intellectual point where they recognize there's something fundamentally wrong with the government being, in effect, dominated and captured by this large economic group. Great points. I'm sitting in that same chair was been David Kuhn and Blaine Higgs and Chris Austin. Other ones will come over time. When Blaine Higgs, leader of the Conservatives, was there, we talked about systemic change because he is part of his campaign pitch already is trying to create systemic change or he wants to do that. What you just mapped out is one of the biggest systems that needs to change. And especially when you point out that uh, the government has not been fulfilling its responsibilities on antitrust laws. Um, it would be fun to explore that one further another day and give it some um, details so other people can follow it. Um, do you think part of the breakthrough that might occur with a true political change instead of that four-year cycle that we're now in, and each of the political leaders said the same thing about the amount of wasted time and energy on that rotation, and the new government trashes everything that the previous government had done, and they start from scratch all the time, which is such a responsibility towards the people and the processes that have come in, in before. Would the breakthrough be the 40% the of people that don't vote? Do they finally have to get off their tail and get involved and actually vote? Because that would upset the, the status quo of, of both liberal and conservative knowing based on their membership. How many people are going to show up? But I, th I, I would gander, and I, again, I don't follow enough of the day-to-day -day ups and downs of the, of the politics of New Brunswick to know yeah. about this. But I would guess that the... Um, because what you're really talking about to change the dynamic is you have to recognize that, we ha that the province has a fundamental power problem, power imbalance problem. Mm -hmm. So if you get elected premier... You have a problem whereby most of the, your economy or much of the economy is controlled by one fairly aggressive corporate entity, which is the Irving family. And I mean aggressive in the sense they do not shy away from throwing their weight around. History hmm. has shown that. Hmm. And now usually, you know, if you're a government and you don't like what company A is selling, you just you take your business or you encourage company B to, to enter the marketplace or you give you know you say co contracts to them or you you, you try to create a competitive environment mm -hmm. um, but you can't do that in New Brunswick or it's very hard to do that in New Brunswick because as I said they control the production chain of so many industries because of this vertical vertical integration mm -hmm. and they control so many sectors so, and, and, and just as an example, and you've seen this, if uh, um, David Kuhn, a couple of years ago, gets up in the legislature and, and asks about the, the, the famous forestry agreement that the province signed with, uh, with J.D. Irving on, on, and said, 
all he's in a very and as you know david's a very sweet man he's not you know Karl marx or lenin right he 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 says i want i just want to know from the ministry of like forestry or natural resources how many jobs were created as a result of this agreement that's all he asked he didn't say you know i want to round up the irving family and send them to prison he just said, you know, you guys signed this contract, this agreement, it's, uh, now a year or two has gone by, how many jobs have been created? Well, the Irvings ran in all of their daily newspapers, full page ads yeah. attacking David Kuhn for asking the question. Yep. Which reflects the fact that if you as a politician go up against them, they're going to use their media capacity and they also have a very sophisticated public relations apparatus, because I, I know, I felt it, <laughs> you know, to attack you. And I think a lot of the political, ca and, I, and one of the, I talked to, one of the people I talked to, he said this to me, he said, all, a lot of the guys who get elected here, they all come in with a sort of like, you know, piss and vinegar that they want to change things. And then as soon as they get elected, they lose their nerve. Hmm. And that's exactly what's happened, is that, is I think it's a combination of the po possibly the, the population is too passive, and then the yeah. politicians who get elected, even if they want to challenge the corporate power of the Irvings, it's a daunting task, and at some point they realize they're not up, not not they're not up to it, and that's by the way not just you know yeah, yeah. true of New Brunswick. Yeah, yeah, it's a global problem. Yep, but it's accentuated here because you live in a reality where you have most of the economy and the media controlled by one family a family that is privately held their assets are privately held so you have no clue mm. what the hell is going on you don't know how much money they're making you don't know how much taxes they're paying you don't know how much investment they're making yeah. and, and, which makes things much more difficult to know what's really happening which would go back to maybe the antitrust legislation um, sort of an odd riff but maybe not in the movie inception the whole notion was to plant an idea in the son's brain right. to break up the company because too much concentration was going one spot same process totally different context but <laughs> so maybe one way of breaking up the pattern is uh, voters actually participating in creating minority governments in new brunswick which doesn't see them and then having that discussion in the legislature being radically different than it has been up until this point in time. Because that's something that can only be controlled by voters. I mean, I, rather than corporation. I, I think with the exception of the Green Party, I mean, which of the parties have a strong, I wouldn't call it, maybe anti-Irving platform is the wrong way to put it, but a, a, a platform that would deal with the, this encroaching oligopolistic, monopolistic power of this one economic uh, group, this one business group. Mm -hmm. And, I, you know, I, the Liberals and the Conservatives clearly don't have it. I, I, don't, I don't think even the NDP have it. No. Nope. You know, nope. so you've got one seat, one man, David yeah. Kuhn, um, you know, who's uh, raising some of these issues as best he can. Mm -hmm. So until, I mean, ultimately these things do get decided politically. People... You see this in, in, you know, all social change occurs from the grassroots. Yes. And, and until you, and I think you are beginning to see it, the impression I get, you're seeing, you're seeing this in New Brunswick a bit more now, whereby you've seen this with the anti-spraying movement on the anti, you know, spraying of glyphosate, which it connects to all of these issues. It connects to the collusion of the provincial government with the, for, for, with the forestry companies. Yep. Um, it, it connects to this issue of public resources, our crown, your crown land, who controls it, who make profits from it. Yep. Um, uh, and it connects to the issues of health and the environment, all of which are motherhood issues. Um, and from what I'm seeing and what I'm hearing is the anti-spraying movement is, is gaining momentum, as you saw with the anti-fracking movement from a few years ago. So there are signs growing signs that that enough New Brunswickers are realizing that they have to be involved to change things. Because, look, this is the other thing that's, that's really important to emphasize, is New Brunswick is not doing so well. 
economically. It's a great place. You come here, it's beautiful, the rivers, the lakes, the Bay of Fundy, the Miramichi, it's all postcard, uh, beautiful. But you have the lowest median income in all of Canada is New Brunswick, while you have, you're paying the fifth highest rate of taxes. Um, you have, you're running a, a, a massive debt and fairly substantial annual deficit. So the debt keeps growing. And that means service payments on the debt keep going. Mm -hmm. It's something like one third of your provincial budget comes from transfer payments. So essentially the federal government is writing you a check yep. to keep your lights on. Yep. You know, you, New Brunswick Power keeps jacking up your power rates, even while it's handing out massive subsidies to, again, like the Irvings and the, uh, the rest of the forestry industry. Uh, the, the, the tax base, you know, companies are not taxed. The amount of taxpayer money that's going in subsidies, grants hmm. to the Irvings and other companies is enormous. Mm -hmm. um, and you have an out-migration of the population. The population is declining while the rest of the population of Canada is going up. Mm -hmm. Because I think pe there's, people are not seeing the opportunities here and they're seeing it's, it's economic, it doesn't make sense. You know. So I, so, so I think there are, on the surface, the New Brunswick looks like this picturesque province, but when you actually start digging into the data, mm -hmm. you know, you are in deep trouble. Mm. And I think probably, I would guess, at some unconscious or conscious level, people are beginning to realize that, that, that there's, some in, there's an imbalance here, there's something wrong, and that the, the, the current path is, you know, and this constant change in governments hoping that it'll change is not working. When Mr. Higgs was sitting in that chair, I asked him, I'm following, a, a challenged a little bit, um, the notion about debts and deficits for provincial governments. So I tracked out for him, um, you know, in 1999, <clears throat> the deficit, if properly accounted for, would have been in the $920 million range. Um, because of the shadow tolls when Bernie Lord took the tolls off the highway. Um, Victor Boudreau in 2009 rolls out a deficit of Liberal government of uh, $740 million, I think it was, to which the reporters then resist a record deficit. And then they work backwards to 99 to find out if Bernie Lord had followed normal accounting principles, that would have been it, according to the Auditor General. But then it drops to $340 million in Blake's, Blaine Higgs' era as finance minister, and now it's pushing 200 million somewhere. Two, 300 million. Yeah. So I asked him, isn't that a good story? That from 19, 1999 to 2015-16, that there's this change when no change in median income, no change in GDP, no, and still let out migration to people. He could have gone two ways. He could have gone, well, it's all kind of made up, which most people in their gut are thinking, this doesn't add up. Or, yeah, it is a good story. And instead he went and talked about HST and never really <laughs> <laughs> answered the question. So that's a, that's a mystery for me is that, well, something happened there and it looks like it's in decline, but that never gets spoken of. So there's that curiosity. And then another thought for what you just said is the Commerce Board of Canada came out with a study about the provinces and New Brunswick came out number one in the province for quality of life and a few other key indicators. Do you have any thoughts about that? Because it, it's another side, the flip side of the coin that you just painted or the picture you just drew about this province is in dire straits. And in some sense, it really is in dire straits. But in another sense, you can find information that shows, well, the deficit's in decline. You're going through this revolving door of political leaders and, and parties. But the Commerce Board of Canada, with its paradigm, comes up and says New Brunswick's a great place to live. Well, it's not. It's it, it. It is. You could you could call it somewhat paradoxical, mm -hmm. okay? Because I think, in one respect, it's true. New Brunswick is a good place to live, if and it's a big if. If you have a decent income, or you have an income, mm -hmm. okay. Um, uh, I think you know. Chances are, for example, you can buy a house here much more cheaply than you can in Toronto. Mm. So you, you know, that's a factor. So 
in some respects, the, the cost of living here is going to be a little less. Hmm. But in many respects, it's not. You know, you're still probably paying the same for power, the same for food, um, you know. The, the, I, I think, so all I'm saying is statistically, you're, you're among the worst off, if not the worst off place to be. In other respects, absolutely, there's no crime here. Mm. Um, you know, you're close to nature. Uh, I, I bet you the stress levels here are much less. Even though, strange enough, the, the suicide rate here is very high. Yes, it is. You have, according to Stats Canada, 53% functional illiteracy here. If you talk to anybody who works in the public sector, they're all complaining about how resources keep disappearing. Dave Kuhn told me that for the entire province, they have two and a half environmental inspectors for the entire province. Hmm. Um, you know, so I think uh, in, in, in St. John, you're, you have a 40 to 50 percent higher chance of getting cancer than you do in Fredericton and Moncton because of your exposure to industrial toxins. Know, to um, hmm. VOCs, uh, volatile organic compounds that you know that are emitted by the refinery and the pulp and paper mill and all the other stuff down there. Yeah. So I think it's like a lot of these things. It's it's there are positive things about life here, and then there are the negative. But I think in if you look at it in total. The fact that you have this out migration, which mm. is to a certain extent, it is not new. Yeah. People have left the Maritimes yep. to, to, for economic reasons going back more than a century. Yep. This is not new. But I think it's now there's a there's a tipping balance. There's a point where you have. Was it McLean's did a story about New Brunswick uh, a year or so ago. Yeah. One of the things they talked about <laughs> is the fact that the you have an aging population. And the young population that would usually sustain the that growing aging population is vanishing, is, is dwindling, because they're leaving. Yeah. So, you know, it might be a great place to live in some respects, but you have, um, you have structural, chronic, continuing problems that, uh, you know, hopefully need to be addressed or should be addressed. And because if they don't get addressed, you know, one of the people I quoted for my series for The Observer is he said you might have a case where this is like a Detroit situation where, the, you know, this, the province goes bankrupt. Um, because, you know, I mean, it's not, the government collects, you know, it's, uh, the CBC has done a number of stories showing how much the government refuses to collect in taxes from the very sources they could collect. Yep. And when you're not collecting taxes, then you, you don't have... You're, you're, you're going deeper into the hawk to bankers um, and or you're not paying uh, for services. You know, you're not paying for a good university system or a good education system. Yeah. And so much has been deferred the past 30 years to the voluntary sector as the government's unloaded so many social services to volunteer organizations which pick up the slack and then the pressures on the household income for the donation in order to make it, make it fly. We have a couple of minutes left. Um, sure. Thoughts? Where, where do you... How do you want to send us out? Something um, fun, something that uh, that you really enjoy doing with your work or, or in your personal life that um, gets you through the energy you must spend in order to do this work. Because <laughs> <laughs> you know? it is, it's intense. Um, when you bring that much heart to it, it has to be intense. So, uh, Well, I'm lucky. I have a, I live in a uh, I, I have a good wife. Uh, I have a very, I, I've really reduced stress in other parts of my life. I don't have children, which helps. I don't, I, <laughs> I, I have a very low cost lifestyle. Uh, I travel when I can. Um, my wife and I went to Russia this summer. So, uh, I play a lot of tennis. Um, I mean, I've been gotten good over the years at controlling the stress. I mean, I gain a certain, it's stressful, but I do gain a pleasure from the work in the sense that um, one of the reasons I became a journalist was was to expose wrongdoing and try to, you know, to 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 
to bring a sense of social justice to the to to the craft and to the to the subject and and now and then I get to do that and um, and I've been you know I've had uh, extraordinarily positive experiences because of people being simply grateful that I've told their story about something terrible that's happened to them. Mm. I just got an email, two emails, uh, was it last week, I'm losing track of time. I had a story that was just came out in uh, BuzzFeed. Uh, it was a piece I worked on months ago, but it was talking about a police not being held to account when they break the law. And, and part of the story dealt with the murder, well, the, the killing of this very sweet young man in a hotel room in Calgary in 2015 by a police officer, a completely brutal, awful killing. And I had interviewed his father, and I told, as part of this bigger story, I told their story and, and, and the terrible loss, and, you know, they sent me, both he and his wife sent me notes thanking me and being very grateful that I got the story out. I mean, it's small stuff, no, it's big stuff. You know, in the sense that I might not, you know, win their lawsuit or whatever, but it, but it, it's the sort of thing where telling a uh, a parent's tremendous grief for the loss of their beloved son in a in a horrible, terrible, wasteful way. Um, you know, th th those are the things that uh, uh, give me the pleasure of my work. Great. Thank you so much for this. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you for watching. Be good. Have fun. Love each other. The Dennis Report is an independent media production. To support the program, go to DennisAtchison.com and click Become My Patron on Patreon. Patreon.